making Watsonville a better uh, place to uh, live and play. And I want to go through this uh, a couple of things. First, the Flyer Program. Uh, the program provides recreational and educational experiences for elementary school students for after school. Kids are picked up at the schools and they're brought to the center and they get to be in a positive uh, environment. It's supervised by our staff and it's safe. It gets them out of having to go home and be alone when parents aren't there. So it's one of the important programs we try and provide. The skate park renovation, that was just huge. It's probably, it's twice the size of the old one. Um, there are so many more activities there for the kids to do. Um, we, that whole event that day when the grand opening, it was huge, it was large. And so it's nice to always see the community come out to these events and it's real important. <clears throat> The Contigo program. Uh, it's a gang prevention and intervention program targeting fourth through eighth graders in the area of Marinovich Park. The neighborhood was targeted and was selected for the program given the high gang related activity that takes place around the area. Uh, the goal for this program is to encourage, is to engage the youth and encourage families with positive activities that help reduce kids' early engagement in the gang activity, the negative behaviors, the truancy, and the low educational attainment. So, and I've heard so many good things about this community. I've had parents come up to me that just thank the city for even doing something like this. I, I think we have more activities here than almost any city I've been to, whether they're special events or functions such as these. I, it's just, it's amazing to me. Camp Wow, um, Wild on Watsonville. It's a weekly summer camp offered at Ramsey Park every summer. Uh, this year we served well over 250 kids. Uh, it offers uh, safe, caring, recreational activity, uh, and it's for kids from 5 to 12 years old. So and they do field trips and all kinds of arts exercises and those type of things. Um, keeping Watsonville active. Youth soccer. Wow, it is a big thing in this, in this area. Um, and, you know, people get out and they're very passionate about it. And our program, we work with the Santa Cruz Bakers and the Pumas to put on a huge program. We have close to 200 youth that participate and um, the parents love it. They'll come out in force and they'll let you know what they feel about it. Um, summer Aquatics. You know, the, uh, we have 420 different residents, families that go to the uh, Watsonville High School pool. The city pays for it, um, so it's not free. The school doesn't, doesn't give it to us free. We work with them as a partnership. And, but it's important to have these different various activities uh, like the aquatic program. And then lastly, we have our trail project. We have a 1.2 mile trail between Lee Road and Walker Road to West Beast intersection that's coming online soon. Uh, and it's part of a 32 mile trail that will connect Watsonville to Davenport. Um, we've worked on new travel uh, trail signage, uh, not just about the trail, but also about things that are not allowed on the trail, whether it be all call, those type of things. Um, it's important because the trail is actually, throughout Watsonville, the sloughs are generally a park. So we have a little bit more flexibility to make sure things aren't occurring in those areas that should not be. So um, lean, learning in our community. Um, I think one of, the, one of the big things that also amazed me is our library. We have a phenomenal library, and Carol, the library director, has done a phenomenal job. She's been here a long time, and you can tell how much her staff loves her and how much pride she takes in her job. So, I mean, I congratulate her for what she's done, and I'm amazed because I haven't seen a library like that in a long time. So, you know, it's an after-school pro STEAM is an after-school program funded by the Friends of the Library. It provides learning in the areas of science, technology, engineering, art, and math uh, involving children on hands-on learning activities. Next, we have the video monitors. I think while I was walking around, I don't even know if Carol was giving me a tour, I was walking around to the library, someone was giving me a tour when I first showed up, and all these teams were sitting there and they weren't on. And I'm looking at them like, okay, I'm not sure why they're on. I started asking questions, are they hooked up, are they not? And, Carol's like, well, they're not. They're supposed to be educational. We want to do a lot of things with this, but there's too much going on and we've lost staff and whatnot. And I think that we found a way to do it. Carol found a way to make it happen. And right now it talks a little bit about the activities going on in the library. 
uh, on, on the monitors. There's like six monitors throughout the library. But I think in the long run, they want to do more educational, showing people how to do email or, or access library uh, activities, those type of things throughout the, they should be more interactive monitors and those type of things. So I think that's her goal in the long run. And I, I know she's probably going to do it. Upgrading the integral library system, I think this was a big, it's the backbone of the entire library system, and I think it was 15 years old, and they wanted to get this done, and it finally got done, and it, you know, it operates an enhanced system that allows for many of the new services for the public library, whether it's automated email alerts, the holds over the dues, online access, patron accounts, online requests, and so this, uh, what I've been trying to do with the city of Watsonville is make it more uh, technological friendly, and step up in a lot of areas that, that needed to be done so that we can communicate better with the public. And I think the last thing from the library in this area is the altar, is the altar program. It's a celebration of the Day of the Dead. Um, I think it's an annual event where uh, loved ones bring in photos of, uh, their, of photos of their loved ones and they put them together in frames in a collage and it, it really, it's a big workshop for the library and it establishes cultural significance between the residents and connecting the libraries in different ways that haven't been done before. Next, the Watsonville Airport. You know, this, um, I, I think in a community such as this where we're lucky enough to have rail, we're lucky enough to have highways and road transportation, having an airport is a vital resource. And having an airport, not as a division, but as a department. Uh, when, when I came in, working with the staff and talking with Rayvon, it, it was evident that the airport had to be elevated in, in a different direction so that we could leverage it with the overall community, our business partners, and just move it forward. So the goal here um, with the council and myself and staff is to start creating a larger uh, community around the airport by leveraging the businesses, utilizing them, utilizing that, creating different streams of revenue throughout the airport so that it becomes more sustainable, so that we can grow the airport, expand the airport, expand the runway, expand the terminal building there, and make it more viable for more than just what's there now. We can get bigger planes and we can do so much more, and, and I think that this airport is a precious jewel of the entire community and we need to help it grow one way or the other. It's real important. But a couple of things that have happened out there this year. You know, I've been fortunate um, to be part of two different brown breakings. Uh, the United Flight Services, uh, you know, they provide air, uh, air, airline, air, airplane repair services. The building's up and going. It's vertically now. I think they're going to open here hopefully in a few months. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did a groundbreaking for American Diesel. Uh, they do sales and service uh, for diesel trucks, and uh, that's already, they're already grading. They're going actually faster than I thought they would. So th these are two great things that have happened at the airport, and I know that Rayvon has taken it upon himself to really engage the tenants and start leasing hangars and, and make more viable long-term business investments in that airport to help that sustainability increase. The obstruction mitigation. Um, there are a number of trees around the airport that make it uh, safety issues. The, the trees are in the ways of flight paths, uh, if there were emergency landing, those type of things, but all, not all the trees are in the city. Some of them reside in the county. So we kind of sat down, Raven on came up with an idea, engaged the county. So now we're working with the county to share some of the cost of eliminating the trees in the county. Uh, and the city, and this is underway as we speak. I know they've been working on it. Tax lien repairs, we've worked on a lot of tax lien repairs over the last few years. I know that this is one of the big concerns of the pilots. We wanna make sure we stay on top of this. If we're gonna grow this airport, then we gotta take care of the assets on the airport that we currently have. Ella's at the airport. Um, I'm here probably once a week at least. Um, I have business lunches there, meetings there, people want me to go there. Beautiful restaurant, they celebrate a one year anniversary and that place is packed. It really is and I'm amazed. I mean, she's done a phenomenal job. Definitely need to recognize her for that. And this is the car show. that We did this car show here a few months back. It was very successful. It's our ability at the airport to try and expand kind of what we do and engage the community to learn a little bit about the airport and kind of see what's out there when they come and look at these events. 
And next coming up though in September, we have the Wings Over Watsonville. Um, it's free for the families. There's gonna be a lot of stuff to do. And those of you that are here, show up over there. You know, go talk to Rayvon, go talk to the people that are there. It's gonna be a great event. The fire department. Um, I think a lot of what they've been doing over the last few years, I mean, they held a, uh, a regional fire academy at the fire station uh, by the airport. They, I think all members, all three, 33 members of the fire department got all their education for the entire year that need, need to be done, but they also worked with Santa Cruz and the Central Fire, Prote fire Protection District as well. Who, they also got edu educated. They did a lot of education for themselves, a lot of training, and they're moving forward quite a bit so that we are prepared in this community for anything that happens, and, and they do a phenomenal job. Next, Measure G, and I'm only gonna say a few things because I believe Chief Han is gonna say something about this. You know, definitely need to thank the council, the community, the businesses, everybody. This was an important thing to do for the community. Um, we've just completed our first year of the employees that we were able to hire through Measure G and expand the services in the police department and shore up the services that we provide in the fire department. So uh, I'm lucky to be here now that this is in place um, because we need it. So next. I want to go over quickly a few things on the budget just to kind of give you some ideas. This is the city's budget, it's $117 million. The little blue piece is the general fund, so it's about $37.8 million. And I'm going to point that out as we go through because it, it becomes more significant so you all understand kind of what we deal with. Over, over the number of years, we had a healthy fund balance in the city, but when the economic downturn occurred, we ended up losing a lot of our fund balance, which is the rainy day funds that help us bail ourselves out in the case of an emergency or other things. In the last year, we've doubled it. it. We're going back up. You know, this is for the hard work of the department heads, from our finance director and our council members keeping an eye on everything and paying attention to what we're doing so we're going in the right direction. This slide is just to give you an idea on fund balance, but if you look to the far right, Watsonville, just 53,000 people on this slide, our general fund is $37 million. You look at Santa Cruz, you know, 63,000, not many more people, but the budget is $81 million. So you look at those two numbers and there's a significant difference. The median itself is 52,000 population with a $66 million budget. And that's important because of the next few slides. Our general fund, the $37 million we talked about, close to 75% is taken up by police and fire. So, and then another small piece by parks and community service. There's, there's not a lot of, fluff in the budget or putting it out other places, it goes to the services on the street. And that's important to recognize because with that Measure G and everything else we're doing, we're trying to get those services out to you and we're putting them where you all asked us to place them. So. General fund revenue, our taxes are 62%, um, and we'll break it down. It's important on the next slide. When we look at this, sales tax is 33%. So our sales tax, is staying stagnant because we haven't been doing too much commercial development in the city. So it's staying constant, it'll grow maybe 1%, 1.5%, while other communities, the Capitolas, the Santa Cruz, they're hitting double digit numbers. I mean, they're increasing dramatically, faster than we are. So we haven't been doing commercial development. We need to engage that part of the community and the Farm, and the farm Bureau and the Chamber and make sure we do that. The other important thing in here is that TOT tax. We currently collect right now between the hotels that we have here, uh, maybe a little over half a million dollars in TOT. The other cities around us, whether it's Capitola or Santa Cruz, uh, they're way beyond that. So with the hotels that have been approved by council, we're looking at uh, probably tripling or almost quadrupling that number, which will add to the base. We can't, and I've said this to a number of people, we can't keep taxing the community. We have to find different ways to figure out our revenue streams we can't continue to do that because it's really not sustainable in the long term. So what we have been trying to do with, with council's help is to diversify the revenue streams so that we are less dependent on sales tax and if a, a recurrence uh, happens in the economy where it go down again, that we're more sustainable uh, for the long term. And two other important things. The finance department and the city council refinanced the, re, uh, the redevelopment bonds that have been out there a number of years. Overall, this saved the city about $800,000. More so, it saved considerably more for the school district and the county. But it's important to know that when we can find ways to save the city money, 
we're going to do it. And the last one, you know, our partnership with uh, Pajaro Valley uh, Management, Water Management, was, is important. When they couldn't issue bonds for themselves uh, a number of years ago, the city did it on their behalf. They refinanced that debt. It is now off the city's books. The city does not have that debt on our books. And it's important because these two things alone increase our bond rating. So hopefully, you know, we're looking at a ballot measure that'll give us road money in the fall. And if that happens, this is gonna come into place so that maybe we can take a proposal to the council to bond for roads, to repair some of the roads, fix what's going on out there, because we really do have to rely on ourselves because we're not getting a lot of help elsewhere. And lastly, you know, I wish I could thank every little small business, about, but these are our large partners that we work with continually, and I want to recognize them. And I know there's a lot of small businesses that I work with and talk to, as does Matt and the chief and the council members, but I wanted to make sure we showed all these people, all these large businesses that are out there. And lastly, you are done with me. Well, good evening, and thank you for attending the City of Watsonville's inaugural State of the City Address. So it's been four months since I was sworn in as your new police chief. And it is an honor for me to speak to you tonight. And I just want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for co-hosting this event. And I also want to just thank everyone here for the warm welcome that I've received and the support you have given your police department. So tonight, I really want to share with you what my vision is for your police department. My vision is this, I want everyone here and the entire community to believe that your police department is the best police department in the nation. I also want my entire department to believe that they are the best police department in the nation. And I'll tell you why. If all of you believe that we are the best, that means you have faith in your officers and that you trust that they are doing the best job that they can do. If all of my staff believe that they are the best, that means morale is very high and work ethic is strong. And that means overall that our relationship with the community is stronger than ever. But in order to move towards that vision, in order to accomplish our goals, we have to have the proper staffing and we have to have the proper equipment. So in 2014, the community passed Measure G, which is a testament to the support that you have for your public safety, the fire and the police department. I tell you right now, if it wasn't for Measure G, your department would be in dire straits. So I want to tell you a little bit about what that money has done for your police department. Some of that money has been able to fund some of our prevention programs, which I'm going to discuss a little later in, in the uh, presentation. But we also have been able to start replacing our old dilapidated fleet. Some of those cars that we have spend more time in the shop than on the street. So with Measure G, we've been able to replace not all the vehicles, but a good number of them, which is a huge benefit for you and us at the same time. We've been investing in new computer systems. We've been able to purchase and update our hand pack radio systems so they they're, have digital capabilities and that'll help us perform better on the streets. We've also been able to invest in safety equipment that we didn't have before. We've purchased protective uh, portable shields that can actually protect against rifle bullets. And in this day and age, I think that's very important for our officers to have that safety. But the most important thing that we've done with Measure G is we've increased our authorized staffing from 68 to 73 positions this year. Next year, we'll be able to add one more position. And then the following year, we'll be, we'll be up to 75 authorized positions. Now, just because it's authorized doesn't mean we have full staffing. So, which takes me to our next discussion is, where is our staffing at today? Okay, your, your police department is severely understaffed still. So currently, we are at 63 full-time, fully trained officers. That's 10 vacancies as of today. Now, those 10 vacancies, we could do a lot more if we had those filled. We could create a unit where we could actually investigate property crimes, quality of life issues, graffiti. Those are all things that affect you as a community that we haven't been able to effectively investigate. Now, it, it is very difficult to hire police officers, quality police officers. Uh, during the, the national climate right now is very difficult um, and we're competing against every agency in the state of California for the same quality candidates. 
I don't know if you knew this, but less than 2% of everyone that applies to be a police officer actually makes it through the entire process, through hiring, through the academy, through the field training program. That's less than 2%. And in addition to that, the people that do make it, it takes up to 18 months sometimes to get fully trained. So if I turned in an application tonight, there's a good chance I wouldn't be a fully trained solo beat officer by December of 2017. So that kind of illustrates the challenges we face when it comes to hiring police officers. So hiring and recruiting is one of our priorities for this year. Uh, but even, even with the low staffing, our crime statistics have gone down, which is a testament to my officers and all the hard work they do. So I'd like to go over some of the stats for this year. I can't go over all the stats because that would take me too long and I just don't have the time for tonight to do that. However, I will cover the type one statistics that we report to the Department of Justice. And these are just the most egregious crimes that you probably are most interested in. So let's start with, and we're gonna compare from this time today to the same time last year. So last year at this time we had two homicides. This year we've had zero. Last year, at this time, we had zero traffic fatalities, and unfortunately, we had one about three weeks ago. But sexual assaults are down by 17%. Robberies are down by 47%. Assaults are down by 12%. Burglaries are up by 9%. I'm going to bifurcate that. So we categorize two different burglaries, commercial burglaries and residential burglaries. So commercial burglaries, and this is a big spike in them, is up 61%. So since January, we had two sets of criminals doing two sets of strings of burglaries. They were targeting salons, and the other group were targeting our phone stores, such as Metro PCS and that kind of stuff. They were breaking in, they were stealing property. Uh, the good news is our detectives were able to identify suspects in both sides and take them all into custody, so I'm hoping with those arrests, that will create a downward spike in that, in that statistic. Uh, so residential burglaries are down by 26%. Thefts in general are down by 34%. Auto thefts are up by 17%, but we have a regional task force that, that is addressing that as we speak. So overall, crimes in Watsonville have gone down by 19% compared to this time last year. Like I said, that's a testament to all the community help and the officers and their, and their hard work. But we have to remain vigilant. We have to remain, um, we don't want to become complacent, so we want to make sure we get our staffing up so we can create those units to benefit the community. As with any crime issue in any city, enforcement is just part of the solution. There's two other sides we have to invest in. It's prevention and intervention programs. So I'd like to highlight two of the programs that we're working that are, I think are very successful. Um, and the first one is called Caminos Hacia El Exito, or Caminos Program for short. So this is a collaboration between community partners through Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, or PVPSA, the Santa Cruz County Office of Education, our very own Watsonville Neighborhood Services, the Police Activities League, and Santa Cruz Probation Department. This is a diversion program for Watsonville youth who commit a first offense, generally misdemeanors. Uh, the goal is to reduce recidivism while holding youth accountable for their actions using evidence-based approaches such as our teen peer court, our neighborhood accountability board, counseling, therapy, and our guiding good choices program which is involving the parents in the process. And we also try to involve the, the students and the kids in pro-social activities and mentorship programs. So this program started in 2012. From 2012 to 2015, we've had 298 kids enter the program. 91% of those kids successfully passed the program. 88% of those kids did not re-offend within six months of graduation. Those kids completed 2,754 community service hours, which I think is incredible. And for this year alone, and we're not even finished with this year, 32 kids have entered the program, 12 have successfully completed the program, and the balance of the kids are still in the program. And they've already completed 1,387 community service hours. 
So those results, I don't know about you, but I think those are incredible, and that's a testament to the collaborative efforts that we have with our community partners. And so, and actually, I think we should give a round of applause to the kids that completed those programs and to our community partners. So, <laughs> see that. so the next program is new for 2016, and it's our care team. So San Diego Police Department just released a report of 10 officer-involved shootings they had in 2015. 50% of those shootings involved people with mental health issues. USA Today just reported that 16, uh, the people with mental health issues are 16 times more likely to be killed by police action. 16 times more likely to be killed by police than another person. That is unacceptable to me. So there's two things we're gonna do at our, our police department to help address the issue. Uh, the first thing is we wanna get all of our officers critical incident team training, or CIT training, over the next year. Those, th that training will help give our officers the tools they need to help de-escalate situations that involve mental health. But even that is not enough, because when somebody calls 911 about a person who has mental health issues, they're calling 911 because that incident has already risen to a crisis. So our responding patrol officers are going in there and a lot of the tools that they have available, they're not options anymore because it's already past that point. So we have to be proactive in our approach to dealing with mental health issues. Um, so this program, I think, is an outstanding program. It is a partnership. Well, first of all, the CARE team stands for Crisis Assessment, Response, and Engagement. And that's kind of what they do. They go out and they assess the situation. So it's a new program. Like I said, it's a partnership with Pajaro Valley Community Health Trust the San Jose, or excuse me, Santa Cruz Behavioral Health Services and the city of Watsonville. And what CARE does is that they, they have two people specially trained, an officer and a mental health worker. They respond to requests for service and also to emergency calls. But the most important thing they do is they proactively go out and contact people who are in need. So CARE partners with numerous community organizations and provides services and referrals in the areas of mental health, shelter and food services, drug and alcohol rehabilitation, veteran services, and also medical care. So in the four months that I've been here as chief, our care team has contacted 83 people. And those 83 people were given either referrals or taken to the services they needed to avoid getting to a mental health crisis. Now that's instead of arrest or incarceration. And those are 80 incidences that we have averted um, and that no use of force was needed. So I think that's a very important statistic. And actually, I'd like to give our community partners and our care team a round of applause for that, too. I think it's very important. <laughs> so as we move forward as a police department, and we rebuild our staffing over the next few years, our goal is to bring back our gang enforcement team. I want to establish a street crimes team also that we can deal with uh, quality of life issues such as blight, graffiti, and vandalism. I want to continue to build upon our prevention programs such as PAL, CARE, and Caminos. I want to also continue to strengthen our community partnerships and invest in our youth moving forward. I also hope to invest and get funding for technology so we can create online reporting so you don't have to have an officer come out to your house and you can go online and just report simple crimes. It just makes things easier. Um, I want to invest also in new traffic safety programs. I have a lot of ideas that I think will be very successful if we can get some of the funding. And I want to continue to improve communication with our community through different technological platforms. So Theodore Roosevelt once said, believe you can and you're halfway there. I believe we can accomplish anything we put our minds to. With continued collaboration with our community partners, with continued support from all of you in the community, we will accomplish our goals and become the best police department in the nation. So in closing, I want to thank again the uh, Chamber of Commerce for co-sponsoring this event. I want to thank the community for all the support you have given me and your police department. 
And most importantly of all, I want to thank the men and women of the Watsonville Police Department for all the work that you do every single day and night. So thank you very much. Next speaker, our next speaker is a graduate of Point Loma University in San Diego. He has a Bachelor of, of Science degree in Political Science. He also has a Master's degree in Public Administration from Cal State East Bay. He served 10 years as a Deputy City Manager for the City of Walnut Creek. Our new Assistant City Manager, Matt Huffaker. There we go. Uh, so as you've heard tonight, it's clear that uh, Watsonville is uh, certainly a community on the move. And uh, I want to spend some, t some time tonight giving you a quick preview of some other things we have, uh, some exciting efforts that are coming down the road. So before we look ahead, I wanted to take a quick look back at Watsonville in 1930. Uh, I wasn't around back then. Uh, <laughs> But as you can see, Watsonville at the time was, a, was a, just a bustling, thriving uh, commercial center. And really one of the premier commercial centers uh, in all of Monterey Bay at the time. Uh, well, there's some big things happening in Watsonville, and there's some big things happening in downtown Watsonville in particular. Uh, and that's happening through partnership with downtown businesses, partnership with our uh, community stakeholders and nonprofit groups. And I'm excited to share some of that work with you tonight. Uh, the first one is a Main Street beautification project. Uh, this will be focusing on the stretch of Main Street uh, between West Beach and uh, Riverside Drive. And uh, this, this project will really be focusing on uh, providing a number of improvements along uh, really one of our core areas of downtown. That'll include uh, median landscaping improvements, uh, gateway signage that you see here, it also uh, include looking for opportunities to expand uh, outdoor public space. In addition to that, we'll be looking at uh, intersection improvements, making Main Street and the downtown more walkable, uh, more pedestrian friendly. You'll see that uh, the project will also include uh, beautification of our crosswalks with decorative uh, crosswalk elements, as well as uh, additional landscaping elements in the, on the Main Street uh, area. So we're really hopeful that this project will help stimulate additional growth in the downtown. Uh, we certainly think it'll help attract new businesses and residents to come into the downtown area. And this is just one piece of our, of our effort to focus on the downtown. Uh, you may have heard a little bit about uh, this project that we're exploring uh, across the street at the, the current City Hall and Police Department properties. So as we look at opportunities to um, really maximize the development potential, look at the highest and best use of our properties downtown. We see one of those opportunities as being, uh, being these two current, uh, these properties that we have. Uh, we're gonna be exploring an opportunity for a mixed use commercial and residential project there. And we really think that this project could be a game changer for helping to revitalize downtown uh, and also bring with it other investment uh, in the downtown area. So more to come on on that. So as we're planning for the future, it might surprise you to hear that we have over 2,000 parking spaces in the downtown. Uh, parking is one of those topics that people are passionate about, uh, including myself, uh, especially when I get a parking ticket. Uh, not that that's ever happened, but. Um, and so what we're gonna be focusing on uh, over the next few months is hiring a, a traffic and parking consultant to come downtown and take a hard look at the way we're managing parking uh, in the downtown area really with a focus of making it work better for customers, for residents, for businesses. We think there's some good opportunity there, and so we're excited to, to move that project forward. Watsonville is uh, one of just a few of a handful of cities in California that's taken the progressive step to move forward with the construction of a high-speed fiber optic network. Uh, the city council gave us authority last month to expand that and we'll be extending uh, that existing network to some areas of, uh, of Watsonville and some of our business parks where the businesses want to grow and they need that in order to do it. Uh, we, we also have plans of partnering with internet providers and making that, uh, that high-speed internet also available to our residents. So we're excited about that project and we're moving forward with that uh, now. We're also excited to see that the Watsonville, uh, Watsonville Film Festival is coming to the Fox Theater. And through private investment 
and community partnership, they are in the process now of revitalizing that theater uh, to really bring it back to the to the iconic community gathering place that it that it can that it can be. And so the city is excited about looking for opportunities that we can uh, help support that effort and partner with them uh, going forward. And really uh, look for opportunities to help the Fox Theater to be an anchor um, and one of our, really our historic uh, community gathering places in the downtown area. Last month, in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, we launched Watsonville Wednesdays at Civic Park. Uh, we had a great turnout for the first event and we have plans on expanding that program with live entertainment. Um, typically the first 30 to 50 people that show up get a free lunch and that's hosted by uh, one of our downtown businesses, uh, partners in that program. Uh, finally, uh, the fire department uh, completed a study in 2006 to look at ways that um, the fire department can continue to meet the needs and uh, meet the community's expectations around level of service. And one of the recommendations as part of that study was to move forward with a third fire um, station, a substation here uh, somewhere in the community. So we're in the process now of working on that. We're identifying uh, properties that would be good candidates or good locations so that we can continue to meet the community's needs both now and in the future for both uh, fire and uh, medical response. All right, we're in the home stretch here. It's my last slide. Almost, is everyone with me? Yeah. All right, okay. Uh, so Watsonville will be one of the first cities in the state to leverage new legislation that allows us to um, leverage future property taxes um, as a result of um, developments that are coming into town and use that property tax increment to fund much needed uh, public infrastructure projects. So we'll be looking at opportunities to do road overlay projects, um, downtown revitalization projects, expanding the fiber optic network, and even helping that, helping to use those resources to encourage development in areas uh, of, the, of the community that are blighted. So we're excited about that. Uh, it's a big opportunity for Watsonville to raise capital for projects that we don't currently have funded. And uh, we're moving forward with that effort as we speak. Okay, so with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. I wanted to again thank the Pajaro Valley Chamber of Commerce uh, for hosting this event. And uh, I'm gonna invite Shaz up to thank our other sponsors. All right. How is this for the first State of the City address? Outstanding. Thank you for everyone.